Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Center for South Asian Studies lecture series. Uh, I'm David Brick. I teach Sanskrit in the Department of Asian Languages and Cultures, for those of you that don't know me. I'm excited to have with us here today, um, Ginny, Professor Ginny Lokanita. She's professor and chair of the Department of Political Science and International Relations at Drew University in New Jersey. She received an MPhil in political science from Delhi University in 1996 and earned her PhD in political science from the University of Southern California in 2006. Professor Lokanita works in the areas of law and violence, political theory, including critical and feminist theory, global human rights, and interdisciplinary legal studies. She's the author of many articles and several books. With Nivedita Menon and Sadna Arya, she edited a Hindi language volume called Feminist Politics, Struggles and Issues, which was published by Hindi Medium Directorate in 2001. Her second book was Transnational Torture, Law, Violence, and State Power in the United States and India. It was published by New York University Press in 2011. And her third book is The Truth Machines, uh, Policing, Violence, and Scientific Interrogations in India, which was published by our very own University of Michigan Press in 2020. Uh, and this, her most recent book, was the co-winner of the C. Herman Pritchard Award from the Law and Court Section of the American Political Science Association. Tracing the interactions between law, science, and policing, her work is at the forefront of work on state power and legal violence in liberal democracies, especially uh, India and the US. Her most recent book examines the emergence and use of lie detectors, brain scans, and so-called truth serum. She shows how these are often characterized as more humane methods of interrogation, but yet rely on a confessional paradigm that is related to torture. The title of her talk today is Scaffolding of the Rule of Law, Legal Violence, Policing, and Scientific Interrogations in India. We are holding this event in a meeting format, and we ask that you all keep yourselves muted. Keep your microphone muted, please, uh, during the talk. We're going to have a Q&A session afterwards, uh, and at that time, uh, you're willing to either raise your hand using that function or uh, ask your question in the chat function. Um, so please welcome in uh, joining me in welcoming uh, Professor Lokanita. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, and I'll thank mute you. myself now. <laughs> Uh, so thanks to the Center for South Asia, South Asian Studies for inviting me, Professor Brick, Professor Hal Dua, and Professor Farina Mir, um, all of uh, whom had been in touch with me over time, and to Clemente for all the logistics. Uh, for me, the center is also very special since it hosts the annual uh, Kavita Datla Memorial Lecture, a dear friend and brilliant scholar who actually helped shape the book that I'll present from today. And I hope that I can visit Michigan in person for the memorial lecture in 2022. Uh, I'm gonna share my um, screen here. Um, so my research has generally been on the relationship between uh, law, violence, and state power in liberal democracies. In my first book, Transnational Torture, focusing on India and US, I traced how jurisprudence that is considered the most legitimate state discourse formally condemns torture, yet ends up accommodating excess violence. In that work, I primarily focused on analyzing legal cases from both India and the US, reports and cultural representations of torture in TV shows like 24 to intervene in a debate on whether torture was an exception in liberal democracies and argued that excess violence was very much a part of the governing in liberal democracies. In the Truth Machines published uh, by University of Michigan Press, so that's exciting as well to be a part of this forum, I shifted from jurisprudence to also examine more closely state actors who are responsible for interpreting and implementing the laws and safeguards against torture. Here, let me segue a bit 
to consider something that the current Chief Justice of Indian Supreme Court, Ramanna said in August in a very important effort to ensure a right to legal aid. And I quote, the threat to human rights and bodily integrity are the highest in police stations. Custodial torture and other police atrocities are problems which still prevail in our society. In spite of constitutional declarations and guarantees, lack of effective legal representation at the police stations is a huge detriment to arrested, detained persons. The decisions taken in these early hours will later determine the ability of the accused to defend themselves. Going by the recent reports, even the privileged are not spared third degree treatment. To keep police excesses in check, dissemination of information about the constitutional right to legal aid and availability of free legal aid services is necessary." End quote. And undoubtedly the problem of custodial torture and deaths has been a prevalent one all through post-independent India and earlier. As I'll argue, custodial torture as I'll argue, custodial torture cannot just be addressed by focusing on the police or noting col colonial continuities. Since the primary statutes governing Indian gov criminal justice system, including the Policing Act, continue from British colonial times. Nor is it a question of just ensuring legal aid, although all of them are important. Rather, as I uh, point out in my book, Truth Machines, the role of actors beyond the police to magistrates and even the Indian Supreme Court's inadequate jurisprudence to semi-state actors, such as forensic psychologists and medical professionals, and indeed the entire state development model of modernization may be important to consider here to understand the relationship between state power and legal violence. And I put forward this concept of the contingent state, which I'll talk about. So let me just start with a very brief overview of what the Indian state's problem with custodial torture is in terms of numbers. We actually don't have statistics on number of torture cases, but we do have some numbers on custodial deaths. The annual report on torture in India 2020 brought out by the National Campaign Against Torture noted that between April 1st 2019 to March 31st, 2020, about 113 people died in police custody and 1569 people died in judicial custody. The report notes in its 2021 report that um, there are 111 deaths in 2020 alone. Thus custodial deaths in India continued despite the strict lockdown during the pandemic. These figures are in line with the number of custodial deaths in previous decades as well. Between 2010 and 2020, the National Human Rights Commission reported that there were 139 deaths in police custody and 1576 deaths in judicial custody annually. While all these deaths may not be due to torture, according to human rights groups, many of them are. Now, torture in India is prevalent in distinct contexts. As human rights scholar, activist Gautam Navlaka had once helped me systematically understand in an interview. In routine cases, it is evident in the numerous custodial deaths that continue to occur even in theft or dispute cases. Think for instance, the new Tamil film, Jai Bheem, that apparently ha has surpassed Shawshank Redemption in its high ratings where Raj Kannu and his relatives from Irula tribe were brutally tortured in custody in a false case of theft. The case is really about how tribal caste, class, and gender identities and assumption of habitual offenders form the police investigation of theft cases. Second is the context of terrorism and organized crime cases facilitated by extraordinary laws. Tada, Pota, Makoka earlier, and now Unlawful Activities Prevention Act that evade routine safeguards against extended detention and delay in bail, often targeting Muslim bodies. Third, in the context of Kashmir, parts of the Northeast, and Punjab previously, 
torture, detention, and disappearances are common because those who commit these crimes have virtual impunity as habeas petitions are often denied. One can now start adding a fourth category which doesn't neatly fit, that of targeting human rights activists and of foreclosing dissent. This refusal to give bail to vulnerable prisoners despite an inability to avoid overcrowding even during a pandemic or putting them in under cell or an egg-shaped cell to punish them also makes these conditions inhuman and torturous. In all these contexts, victims of torture and custodial deaths are predominantly from poor and marginalized groups, including tribal, Dalit, women, transgender, and minorities, particularly Muslims. And as I noted earlier, those who dissent, though it could extend to others as well. On November 8th, there was a custodial death of a Muslim youth, Altaf, in UP, and the shocking video of a police officer claiming that Altaf had committed um, suicide in custody in Kaskanj, UP, by using a string of a jacket to hang himself on a two and a half foot, uh, feet water pipe. You can see it here. When seen in light of numerous fact-finding reports by the People's Union for Democratic Rights and others, the category of illness and suicides dominate the official explanation of custodial deaths, as you see in the chart, and help elide the relationship of torture and custodial deaths. If these are the contexts in which torture exists, the puzzle in my book that I started off with is why in a context where torture exists with such impunity and officials rarely convicted or charged, partly because of an absence of a specific law against torture and non-ratification of the UN Convention against torture, a discourse on truth machines to replace physical torture appeared. And how does it help us understand the relationship between state power and legal violence in liberal democracies. In addition to focusing on legal cases, reports, political discourses, and popular representations, I conducted interviews with police, forensic psychologists, lawyers, and activists in five cities, Delhi, Hyderabad, Mumbai, Bangalore, and Gandhinagar, visiting forensic science labs, and in these cities to understand the relationship between law, science, and policing. I focused on the emergence of, the, of three scientific techniques that I termed truth machines, narcoanalysis, brain scans, and lie detectors. Very briefly, narcoanalysis is the injecting of sodium pentothal for inducing confessions or information, popularly known as the truth serum. The second is brain fingerprinting and its Indian version brain electrical oscillation signature test that supposedly captures experiential participation in a crime through an electroencephalogram and lie detectors that measure physiological indicators. My focus is to study and understand the everyday practices of the state not captured by more monolithic conceptions of the state, whether it's a more Weberian bureaucratic conception of monopoly over legitimate violence constrained by rules or a more Agamben-inspired understanding of a sovereign state's violence over bare life. Here I draw more from the anthropologists of the state and adopt a more ethnographic sensibility. I put forward the idea of a contingent state, which refers to the way states constantly oscillate between the desire to be unitary and the inability to do so under certain conditions. The concept of contingent state points to the continually negotiated nature of the relationship between state power and legal violence. For instance, if we just see the emergence of these techniques, it's both a story of a disaggregated arbitrariness on one hand and state intentionality on the other. There's often an assumption of clear intentionality in state techniques. Think of changes in methods of executions in the US, from hanging to lethal injections that Austin Sarat, for instance, writes about, or from scarring to non-scarring techniques, as Darius Rejali has famously noted. But interviews with the police 
in India suggest the contingency of these techniques. The rise of these particular truth machines in India were actually the result of clear contingencies. Ambitious forensic psychologists in forensic science labs in Gandhinagar and Bangalore wanting to gain visibility legally and in public that led to the popularization of these techniques. At some point, the truth machines also fitted the post-colonial state's desire to appear as using scientific and modern techniques, in part due to the critique of the human rights movement that was consolidating in the 1980s, 90s. It was primarily after 1975 to 77, when there was an emergency declared by the then Prime Minister Indira Gandhi due to internal disturbances and one saw wide scale torture and detentions taking place, that there was a consolidation of the human rights movements uh, to focus on protection of human rights. And one of the major issues was how to deal with the question of custodial torture and deaths, particularly of political prisoners, though over time on custodial deaths and torture more generally. Groups such as People's Union for Democratic Rights, People's Union for Civil Liberties, and Andhra Pradesh Civil Liberties Committee and international NGOs like Amnesty focused on these questions. Both due to the internal and external pressures, India set up a National Human Rights Commission that focused on custodial deaths. The 1990s also became a period where Supreme Court jurisprudence on torture like the DK Basu case emerged, which used an expanded notion of due process using Article 21 of the Indian Constitution to uh, acknowledge the pervasiveness of torture. The court created safeguards such as an arrest or custody memo to involve the family or public as a witness to their arrest, since illegal detention is such a major um, form enabling torture. A pre-trial right to a lawyer and a regular medical exam and the court has periodically focused on the implementation of the safeguards as well. So when I trace the emergence and consolidation of the techniques, even though lie detectors existed earlier, it was only in the 1990s that these techniques collectively emerged. And one of the primary reasons for its ascendance was that there was a claim of these techniques replacing physical torture. As a retired police officer put it, when I and others joined the police department, there was no narco analysis or such things were unheard of. Only third degree and torturing the criminals was the method that was being used, which is not legal. Narco analysis came, human rights came. We had to use very patient methods, very slow detection. Breakthrough took some time, end quote. I suggest that it is in the 1990s, 2000s, that the aspirations of forensics, uh, individual forensic psychologists seem to merge with the need of the post-colonial state to use science and expertise to find technical solutions for police torture. In some ways, it is similar to what Timothy Mitchell calls the technopolitics in the context of Egypt, an alloy of non-human and human, or what I call an attempt on the part of the primarily female forensic psychologists to be a cyborg of sorts, a combination of scientific machines and use of therapeutic art to be distinguished from the brutal police. The ills of the Indian criminal justice were to be addressed by the developmentalist state to create a state forensic architecture with machines and experts, with no regards for reliability or validity of these techniques or their coercive aspects. Thus, the state's modernization paradigm welcomed these techniques as crucial for police reform. In fact, the state high courts in mid-2000s that considered the constitutionality of these techniques basically upheld the techniques as replacing the physical torture by involving medics and as a natural extension of the investigation, considered safe as they represented modernization similar to other life-saving machines like MRI. In the state of Andhra Pradesh versus Srimati Inapura Padma and others, for instance, the court notes, this is the high court, in the, in the accusations made in India, the police are attributed with applying third degree methods in eliciting information. 
and there are instances of the culprits or suspects dying in lockups during the course of interrogation on account of application of third degree methods. Therefore, there's a blame that the Indian police are flagrantly violating the human rights. Therefore, there's every need to apply scientific tests to elicit the information from the culprits, end quote. The truth machines were only available in a very few labs, though my interviews reveal that there was initially a plan to build a huge network of these truth machines, even at the district levels with mobile forensic science labs and was a developmental priority for the Indian state. The Supreme Court, even when it intervened in 2010, while unequivocally ruling out the involuntary use of the techniques, focused mostly on consent and inadmissibility of evidence as a result of these techniques, though allowed for exceptions in terms of admissibility as well. In the process, even the highest court doesn't question the paradigm itself of using questionable signs, of allowing medical professionals who had played an uneven role against torture in the past and doesn't, com doesn't completely challenge conditions of police custody or remand, which in the Indian context was, is often seen as synonymous with torture. It is also important to note that both lie detectors and narcoanalysis or truth serums have a long history in the US whether for Dr. Uh, Robert House, who popularized narcoanalysis through experiments with prisoners as a way to deal with physical third degree in 1920s and 30s, though there was also an attempt to see whether it could be used for interrogations by the scientific crime detection lab until that interest faded. The CIA picked it up during the Cold War and narcoanalysis was also considered briefly in the post 9-11 context though never really approved. There's a continued fascination about the techniques with brain fingerprinting as a more recent innovation, even as their reliability and validity was always in doubt, especially for legal purposes. Yet in the US, at least their persistence often remains in the realm of the popular than necessarily legal. And I trace that history in the US in my book in terms of the cultural production of these techniques that sustains fascination in them. In the Indian context, the truth machines, of course, didn't actually replace physical torture because they got used in very few cases, are themselves coercive, and they often got used alongside physical torture for terrorism-related cases in order to get particular answers. Let me explain with the help of the Mumbai blast case. On July 11, 2006, seven bombings occurred on local trains in Mumbai. 189 people were killed and over 800 injured. Once the anti-terrorism squad Mumbai took over, 13 Muslim men were charged with the crime, having been charged under the Indian Penal Code, as well as under two extraordinary laws, the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act and the Makoka, Maharashtra Control of Organized Crime Act. And in 2015, 12 of them were convicted and one acquitted. All the accused were reportedly tortured and at least 12 confessed. Methods of torture included electric shocks and beatings with a flour mill bell. As one recounted, and I quote, the police started beating me by flour mill bells and sticks on my palms and soles. I was tied by rope and given electric shocks to my private parts. End quote. Similar to the black box that Lawrence Ralph mentions in his account of police torture in Chicago in his part breaking book, Torture Letters. Other methods in the Indian context, including stripping men naked, putting them in stress positions, beating the palms of their hands and feet, forcing them to sit with their feet at 180 degrees. One detainee mentioned the injecting of liquid chemicals through his anus. A torture room of the anti terrorism squad figures in these narratives. Other methods of instilling fear were threats of torture, detention, and extrajudicial killing, together with the targeting of family members, including the threat of rape for women. Family members might be brought to the station to be harassed and insulted, and occasionally also subjected to stripping and beating. 
Abdul Wahid Sheikh, the only person acquitted in the case and author of an incredibly stringent critique of the Indian criminal justice system, um, Beguna Kedi or Innocent Prisoner, which has now been translated into English from Hindi and Urdu in a webinar called The Focus of the Family as Fourth Degree. I especially want to note here the role of the magistrates and doctors in the case required by law to ensure protections against torture. The magistrates in front of whom these men were produced rarely inquired into these cases. Before each hearing, the accused were threatened not to reveal their experiences. As one detainee noted, the police, I quote, threatened that if we complain about beating and torture, they would involve our family members in the case and would torture us more. Therefore, I did not say anything be before the judge because of the fear, end quote. If they protested, the accused were tortured again. One had an infected ear from the use of pliers, but he was warned not to complain or the torture would be even more brutal. One detainee described waterboarding. I quote, a wet cloth was put on my face because of which I was not able to breathe. They had an apparatus with them by which probably they were measuring my blood pressure. And after a certain level was reached, they used to re remove the cloth. End quote. Only when he agreed to confess did the torture stop. He was then given some ointments or taken to the hospital when he was warned not to complain to the doctor. Only occasionally, he recalled, would a magistrate ask for a medical examination, but doctors overlooked his injuries even when they were aware of severe torture. Before a court hearing, suspects might be allowed to sleep so that they did not appear tortured in front of the magistrate. As one accused explained, and I quote, I was taken for medical checkup many times during police custody, but was not physically checked by the do doctors, not allowed to speak with the doctors. The veil was not removed at any time, but only my thumb impressions were taken. After his brother was also tortured, another of the accused realized that the punch namas or documents he was forced to sign involved recovery of admissible evidence. The body must provide oral proof. Doctors and magistrates who are by law charged with ensuring the veracity of procedures thus fail to challenge the possible extraction. As a lawyer in another terrorism related case said, I quote, so my question is how come the judiciary how come those magistrates who remanded these boys without complying with that mandatory requirements of the Supreme Court, how come disciplinary action was not taken against them? In the act, absence of action against judges who convict on flimsy evidence or magistrates who fail to follow safeguards against torture, this lawyer noted. Otherwise, what is the message I get as a Muslim? They were able to play football with your life, with your career, your human rights, and this Damn all that you can do. What's the message judges will get? Play whatever games you can, you are immune." End quote. Each step in the procedure must be followed, even if substantively undermined. Even under Makoka, used in the uh, Mumbai case, a confession must be voluntary. The deputy commissioner of police must warn the accused without police pressure about the right to silence, and then asked to repeat the confession in front of the magistrate who ensures a medical examination outside police custody. All these measures ostensibly ensure that a suspect confess voluntarily and not due to torture or pressure. But in practice, each step becomes a little more than a bureaucratic check mark, indicative more of a scaffolding rather than the rights of the accused. Rather than revealing the violence, the state and semi-state actors mask the violence through the bureaucratic check marks. The procedures are technically followed, thereby preserving the scaffold of the rule of law, but ends up masking the state violence. The scaffolding keeps these elements of the system in place, providing a facade of a rational bureaucratic system. For Foucault, who writes of the spectacle of the scaffold, the scaffold through public execution and torture confirmed the truth of the crime in public. The scaffold of the rule of law, however, ensures the truth of the crime in public through procedures meant to avoid the theatrical production of torture by actually masking it.
This is also visi most visible in terrorism cases, but also seen in the Jairaj and Benix case in Tamil Nadu that happened uh, in June 2020, after they were picked up ostensibly in context of pandemic violations. In that case too, the doctor and the magistrate failed to ascertain that the father and son had been tortured, even as they bled profusely, and they later died in the hospital, that prompted rare outrage in the Indian context, echoing George Floyd and Breonna Taylor's protests here. Thus, when the definition of the rule of law primarily focuses on formal procedural safeguards and judiciary's role in protecting individual rights, the violence within is hidden. The detainee narratives thus help reveal the violence and also challenge those who keep it in place. When we just focus on the police, we fail to notice how the scaffold of the rule of law is created collectively by police, magistrates, and doctors, and I'll soon add forensic psychologists. Let me not now talk about why this, these techniques that I call truth machines occurring in some forensic science labs are crucial for our discussion on torture. In the 2000s in particular, the techniques were extremely popular and all the three were available in Bangalore, Mumbai and Gandhinagar. And yet despite the fact that the popularity went down after the Supreme Court intervened in 2010, the techniques never disappeared. As someone who has been studying torture for a while, it was interesting to note that the response to incidents of custodial deaths was often to turn to truth machines. In December 2017, in relation to a report of custodial deaths in Maharashtra, the Director General of Police sent an internal circular requesting police to use forensic science. According to news reports, elaborating on the scientific methods, the circular suggests that the police opt for lie detector, polygraph, brain mapping, and narcoanalysis tests. Indeed, as recently as 2020, we saw that the Delhi High Court was indignant that the capital of India didn't have a narco facility and forced the Delhi government to set up one even during the pandemic and then complained that it was not expansive enough, once again giving the impression that narco analysis or truth serums remain an important site for criminal investigations, if not substantively or numerically, but at least symbolically. The concept of contingent state that I propose in the book as opposed to a unitary or exceptional state then helps us think about the role of other actors involved in policing. Alongside the magistrates the pol and police, the forensic psychologists who claim that they are different from the police and provide therapy as an extension of the machine. As one psychologist said, I quote, while torture is an external stimuli, these techniques are internal ones and invite an internal journey. They force you to review your past in a different way, not confess, but ask them to think about their selves, themselves and come back. It's a moment of catharsis in the legal system. Unlike the police custody where there's fear of encounter or custodial deaths or torture, here there is empathy, end quote. In the Mumbai Blast case of 2006, Sheikh, the only one acquitted, um, and author of Beguna Kedi, I mentioned him earlier. I should also um, add that he's now an activist and lawyer for the Innocence Project, also initially believed that the truth machines conducted by the doctors would really reveal the truth about his innocence unless he, until he realized that it wasn't to be. The psychologists even claim that the techniques won't work if the persons are physically or psychologically harmed gesturing to a shift in the mode of interrogations. But then of course they end up creating the same conditions in labs and hospital that prop up physical torture. By utilizing these coercive machines to get confessions involuntarily and therefore need to be squarely rejected. Yet the management of this violence and the actors beyond the police are important to recognize in their disaggregated and multifaceted form. Why were the truth machines a problem? As medical ethics scholar and activist Amar Jesani characterizes narcoanalysis as a form of pharmacological torture. He writes, torture in fact remains torture 
even if it does not spill blood, break bones, and is done in sterile air-conditioned operation theaters. Similarly, PUDR noted, narcoanalysis no negates protections by making redundant the right to silence of the subject. And this is even ignoring the fact that there's no uh, scientific reliability and validity for these tests at all. Even when the Supreme Court intervened to ensure that the techniques were done with consent and evidence wasn't actually admissible, there was no attempt to question the role of doctors or medical professionals in these techniques, who in any case have played a more dubious role in torture-related cases generally. The court have, for instance, acknowledged, like other contexts of confessions, the possibilities of manipulation in narcoanalysis was tremendous. In the Mumbai Blast case, the accused insisted that they were forcibly asked to consent to narcoanalysis. Consent in custody thus became a charged concept. As one account demonstrates, Dr. Malini, one of the most infamous forensic psychologists in Bangalore, misbehaved and slapped me twice before the test. They asked me to say some things before a video camera and beat me before asking me to say the sentences. She threatened that if I do not give correct answers, she would give me AIDS injection. I became semi-conscious after the injection of narco test was given. She asked illogical questions to me during this condition. The camera was switched on and first she asked how many bombs were prepared. I answered I'm not concerned and I'm falsely involved. She slapped me strongly and started pinching my left ear with pliers, because of which I suffered much. She then asked me what comes after six, and I answered seven. She asked me on what TV operates, and I answered that it operates on electricity. She again slapped me strongly and caught my ear with pliers and told me to say by remote. She asked me many such illogical questions and used to ask me to repeat the answers if I did not give the expected answers. Both tortured me badly during the narco test. Human rights activists have criticized narco analysis as a violation of the self-incrimination clause of the Indian constitution, with questions asked of someone not fully conscious. This instance, however, appeared to violate even the self-proclaimed standards for narco analysis conducted in a hospital or forensic laboratory. Pliers were reportedly used during the procedure, illogical questions were asked, and specified answers demanded. Each test concluded with an interrogator's insistence sorry, for a signature on a tailored confession. The depositions in these cases thus undermine any claim to replacing torture with narcoanalysis and police with forensic psychologists and how merely ensuring consent may not mean much. The simultaneity of torture and truth machines is important here. Torture leads to a confession that must be recreated to a non-physical scientific technique. CDs from narcoanalysis sessions were edited to suit the police narrative. As a lawyer described the account of one of the accused, they played the CD of the narco test to me, and I was shocked to see that in place of my reply to the question as to how many bombs were prepared, the reply was seven. Anyone could see that the CD was edited because the words were not in sync with the video, end quote. As Sheikh warns in Beguna Kedi, suspects should never answer in the negative because their responses could be manipulated to appear as if they are answering other questions. The video camera thus became, becomes a means for generating public confessions. So when one thinks of the link between these truth machines to torture, it is not just that techniques are coercive, but also in the fact that they were used to legitimize a shift in physical torture as a way for a democracy to show its commitment to rule of law, of dealing with torture, even as it was never replaced and merely created another site for extraction of confession, this time with the help of science and experts, which fit the modernization narrative, the civilizational discourse that all liberal states claim and post-colonial states in particular strive for.
finally, the notion of the contingent state helps both capture the experience of those impacted by the violence, but also has points of intersection with the police accounts in terms of what creates a possibility of resistance or break from within the state violence. Uh, Sheikh, in his powerful book, Beguna Kedi, reveals what the police are constrained by, a dead body in custody. Quote, Lekin yaad rakhiye, police aapko torture se maan nahi dalegi. Wo to ek keval itna maaregi ki aap dar kar, uska kaam kar de. Wa is tarah nahi maaregi jisse, jisse gehre zakhm ho, isliye puri koshish kare ki camera ke saamne koi bayan na de. I translate, but you should remember that the police will not kill you with the torture. They'll only uh, beat you to the extent that you agree to do their work. The police won't beat you in such a way that there are physical wounds. So try your best not to give a statement in front of a camera, end quote. This sentiment is echoed by a police officer in a training academy who connected the human rights movement, the NHRC reports, and the DK Basu case. These, he believed, collectively made the police much more nervous about deaths in custody. I quote, his, the suspect's safety is in your custody. You don't want him to die. So you take care of him, your brother. You're scared of death, end quote. Often the Indian police is understood either as a colonial continuity or inspired by more Marxist conceptions as repressive institution of the state. These insights are less revealed in my interviews, and in this limited sense, drawing from new police studies scholars, I term it the pastoral role of the police mediating the course. I point to how studying the police as a site of state power in the everyday sense allows for an access into the structural constraints of the police, but above all reveals in their own words the pragmatic logic of why third degree continues. It is the fear of the custodial death that has allowed for the mediation of the coercive with the pastoral. The emergence of these truth machines thus help one understand the vacillation of the contingent state uh, and whether there are shifts and cracks possible in both the narratives and practices of the state that have life and death consequences for those who experience state violence. It also reminds you then of the need to focus specifically on the constantly negotiated relationship between state power and legal violence as central to our study of police and state. While state has been studied and violence as well, I suggest a need for a state violence studies. A state violence studies specifies the bodies targeted as sites of state power and the need to understand mechanisms of state violence in liberal democracies. Police proximity to the means of violence requires scrutiny of the police and their everyday interaction with subjects. Considering human rights reports and testimonials documenting everyday practices, state violence studies can conceptualize state violence through attention to concerns like impunity or custody. Identifying the mechanisms through which the state applies violence uh, state violence study can also mediate theoretical assumptions about the police as either a bureaucratic body or a monolithically repressive institution. The notion of a contingent state thus accounts for the need to study the shifts, cracks, and possibilities of transformation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the really interesting and very clear talk. Uh, the fact that I was able to follow it, though this isn't my area at all, I think uh, speaks to the clarity of your presentation. Um, so it's time for uh, the Q and A. Um, if anyone has any questions, uh, like I said before, you're welcome to put them in the chat. If it's a short question, or if you'd rather ask it in person, uh, then uh, just raise your hand, please, using the chat function, and I'll call on you uh, in order. No questions. I have one. Uh, maybe I'll I'll ask if no one. I don't see any 
questions. Uh, so I, I noticed when you talked about police or deaths uh, in custody, uh, you had that thing at the beginning and then certain number were in police custody, certain number were in uh, judicial custody. And I was just thinking that in the US context, maybe I'm wrong about this, but I think that would be unusual to have judicial custody torture because the, at least by the police, because I don't know to what extent the police have access to people in judicial uh, custody. So anyways, how, how does that possibly, how are deaths um, in judicial custody possibly examples of torture of that kind? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I make a distinction between the police custody and judicial custody for that reason, because uh, in judicial custody, it may be a range of different reasons. Um, for instance, you know, it could be um, even related to violence within, it could be um, sort of um, uh, what prison guards are able to um, uh, in, sort of uh, do, right? And you also have um, illnesses that uh, may uh, result into deaths as well. So those figures, as I said earlier, uh, were actually um, due to a range of different reasons. Sure. Uh, and um, and then a, a lot of the uh, people who are in custody, um, in judicial custody are also um, sort of pre-trial detainees, right? So they're there for a long time. So there's always some involvement of the police uh, over time in that context as well. Thanks. And I also had the methodological question that, I mean, it's not my area at all, but I'd be interested to know, do, is there any possible way to get at more than anecdotal evidence of torture that doesn't result in death? Um, yeah, I mean- I presume, One would assume, like you said at the end, that most uh, cases of torture wouldn't result in death. The police don't want to kill people for the reason that they would then have to explain it. Um, maybe for other reasons too, but at least for that reason. So the question of the other kinds of torture, I, I understand it's the kind of thing it's hard to get at. They're not yeah, the yeah. like that paperwork on doing illegal activities that are then going to be documented. Right, uh, right. So I anyway. Mean, yeah, no, I think that's a good question. Actually, you know, uh, there was a study that was sort of a multi-country study that was done um, and I and another um, uh, co-author, we were involved in um, sort of looking at uh, torture prevention initiatives from 1985 to 2014. And in that particular context, um, you know, we found that while other countries did have uh, some numbers uh, of torture cases, in the Indian context, uh, it's mostly been through reporting. Um, of um, sort of uh, cases that have been documented by human rights, uh, you know, human rights groups and so on. Um, so in fact, that is one of the things that um, we had sort of argued that, um, you know, there's a way in which because deaths in custody can be explained in many different ways. Um, so as a result, um, you know, you are able to disconnect um, you know, torture from actually the deaths in custody, right? Um, but if you were forced to collect data on torture cases itself, then basically we would have, uh, uh, you know, there would be a much more sort of specific um, numerical assessment of the number of cases. So I also feel that the very fact that the focus has been much more on custodial deaths has actually, um, you know, uh, sort of um, drawn attention away from custodial torture. Yeah, no, I think so. Uh, well, thank you. I've, I'm supposed to say something here. Uh, Clemente wisely told me. So I'm supposed to ask people if you have a question uh, to write directly to you. I think there's one need. hand raised. In the chat, um, I guess, so write directly to me. Though, though there's one thing on chat, we'll get to the hand raised. Uh, okay. Oh, JJ, I guess you're the one that asked. Do you want to ask the question or do you want me to read it out? I can ask it. Yeah, same same person. Um, and yeah, basically what it says there in the chat. But um, at the end there, you just said um, about talked about alluded to the shifts, cracks and possibilities for change and reform. And I asked about any cross national comparisons you may have made 
you didn't mention a bit about the U.S. George Fourth case, but um, also I could add lastly just about you mentioned the the role of the ha these modern this modernist narrative and these civilizationalist discourses in the Foucault in other senses, and I wonder how much is out there either in your scholarship or others that could be applied. I mean, presumably certainly can be applied outside of India, but how useful is that as a framework uh, to apply in any number of nations or regions? Anything, anything on those and on, on that basis? Okay. And for some reason, I couldn't see anything in the chat. I don't know why, uh, why that was the case, but uh, just that's why I didn't. Um, yeah. So yeah, the default so the default know. recipient says Clemente, Beggy, but. Uh, Oh, okay. So it's only going so, to... Um, that's the wrong yeah. address. Yeah. But... <laughs> all right. All right. So, so that's the reason Professor I can't Lopinita. see it. That's why that. No, thank you for okay. asking that. Yeah. Okay. Asking that question. Yeah, I wanted to mention yeah. that unfortunately copy and paste does not work by default on uh, Zoom. So I, I was typing, <laughs> but it takes oh, a little okay. bit to retype the questions. So. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Thank you, Clemente. Yeah. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, so, um, so yeah, I mean, I think that's a, a great uh, uh, question. I think um, uh, in terms of the um, sort of the framework of um, sort of the civilizational discourse. I mean, I, I actually really feel that one of the reasons why post 9-11 uh, in the context of the US, right? Um, you know, there, there was, the, there were, and that's sort of what had prompted my um, sort of framing of thinking about torture and liberal democracies is, uh, is, was the immediate attempt to think about the return of torture, right? So it was framed as, mm. okay, should we once again start thinking about torture? Um, and uh, and it became this huge thing, oh, once again, US is thinking about torture, even though torture was a thing of the past, right? Uh, in fact, you know, there were, um, I remember I looked at constitutional law case books and, you know, there was one um, um, sort of case on torture in 1930s, right, the Brown versus Mississippi. And basically that was the end of that section, right? This understanding mm -hmm. that basically, um, you know, uh, torture was replaced and slowly uh, that torture didn't exist in, um, in um, sort of in the context of US. Uh, and partly it was because of the way in which torture was sort of assumed to be absent, right? This idea that it sort of disappears, um, you know, there's a narrative of progress, right? That Edward Peters and Darius Rajali um, and, um, you know, and others have written about and Langbein have written about sort of this fairy tale of abolition of torture, um, you know, which sort of feeds into a civilizational um, uh, discourse uh, while all the different ways in which torture and excess violence actually are allowed to remain, you know, whether in terms of police brutality or prison uh, solitary confinement or other kinds of disciplinary measures or at Guantanamo or in detention centers, all those spaces sort of are left out of this narrative of progress, right? And, and then, of course, you know, when you look at uh, um, Lawrence Ralph's book or other books on Chicago, you realize that even in the context of interrogations and uh, torture, uh, torture actually continued, right? Um, and um, mm -hmm. and was allowed. So, so for me, that framing is, you know, we, the denial of torture as something that is by definition, um, you know, uh, is seen as absent has been a very important uh, thing to un unpack, right? Because um, that um, framing has allowed for the lack of uh, close attention to the ways in which excessive violence has actually been accommodated. And that's sort of what I refer to when I talk about the civilizational discourse. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, there's a hand raised, but first, um, there was a question in the chat that I think is really interesting. So I'm going to ask, it came in just before. Uh, so uh, Theo asked um, you to please comment on any changes in the use of non-physical torture uh, during the Modi administration. So any changes in non-physical torture during the Modi administration? Yeah, I mean, I think... Um... 
if at all we've only seen a kind of a, you know intensive right uh, basically a more aggressive use of um, state violence you know in different ways um, and um, basically so for instance um, you know, the fourth category that I talked about um, in terms of how dissenters and protesters, um, you know, and human rights activists have been targeted much more under the Modi administration than uh, earlier has also meant, and some of it has happened in the context of the pandemic, right? So uh, just to give one example of a famous uh, case, um, uh, actually an infamous in, in many ways because of the tragic um, ending uh, was um, of uh, Stan Swami, uh, who was in uh, um, basically a, um, picked up in the context of uh, a case and he was in his 80s and um, you know uh, just wanted to die back home and he was not given bail even to, you know such that he actually died the day his bail hearing um, you know came up in the court um, and this is despite the fact that evidence related to the case has been continually um, challenged so um, similarly you know activists have been put in um, what i mentioned the solitary confinement kind of uh, little um, jails, uh, which are meant precisely just to discipline them further, right? Um, so I, I would say that, um, you know, there's a history that has continued from before, right? So it's not that the Modi administration has created all these legal frameworks um, or institutional structures, but at the same time, definitely in terms of the targeting of uh, particular, um, you know, bodies, right, whether they're Muslims who were protesting, um, you know, um, or um, sort of um, the human rights defenders, there's been actually an aggravation, there's sort of an intensity uh, that has increased. Thank you. Uh, I think Celia Burke has her hand up. Yes. Hi. Um, thank you so much for this talk. This was um, really interesting. And I'm very intrigued by this idea of the contingent state. Um, and I actually wondered if uh, you might uh, be willing to comment a little bit about Alan Feldman's work. Um, he has this paper on the actuarial gaze. And a lot of your talk reminded me of that paper. Um, in that paper, he talks about not just state violence, but the representation of state violence and how and why states choose to allow those representations to circulate and become public. Um, and one of the effects, right, is he's talking about um, Abu Ghraib prison and the American occupation of Iraq. Um, and he talks about sort of this way that risk ends up getting articulated um, by making an American audience feel as though they are less at risk because they're seeing Iraqi bodies bearing this risk of state violence, basically. Um, and so I'm really curious, I guess maybe this also goes in with the, the question that just came before about the choices that states and state institutions are making um, about when and how these violences are representable or um, when the representations of violence circulate. Um, because that seems to also be sort of instrumental in state practice. Um, and so I'm guessing that, you know, maybe uh, how the media uh, is involved here is, is also part of, of what I'm getting at. But I'm, I'm just really curious about like the representation of violence and how that's playing a role. Um, because it seems to be very, I mean, like your people are manipulating um, subject confessions and, you know, Feldman doesn't really talk about any of that stuff. And so that you, you must have something really interesting to say about these representations. So I'm, I'm curious, thanks. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm, you know, Feldman's work of course is extremely helpful and, uh, um, you know, uh, very formative. Um, so so I, I do think that in terms of representation, um, one of the things that you realize, uh, particularly, and this is something that I feel, you know, um, has sort of uh, really, I've been thinking about this ever since, you know, this question of why is it there were these commentators who asked that, you know, there was um, the, the, the Jairaj and Benix case that I talked about, the father-son duo who were 
uh, tortured and so on. So we saw some rare outrage in the Indian context. I say rare outrage because even though there's obviously a very strong, you know, uh, I think human rights and uh, democratic rights movement and uh, there are groups and so on, but, uh, but rarely does it become a subject of popular outrage. So I, you know, and even though you might have images or videos actually circulating, right? So in that sense, I do feel that um, sort of the comparison with Abu Ghraib is, right? I mean, one of the things, there's so much, there was so much uh, discussion on both the outrage and of course, you know, what, what did the outrage do? And, you know, um, there's some very interesting discussion about whether the outrage became about what US public thinks, right? So, you know, Basuli Deb has this amazing article where she talks about uh, this point uh, about, um, you know, ultimately the outrage becomes about, you know, US public and US military and US women and, you know, and so on and takes it away from what's happening with Iraqi bodies, right? Uh, there's also this question of what happens when they're not, there, there aren't any videos, right? Or photographs and so on. But I think what has been very um, striking in the uh, Indian context is um, sort of a, both a lack of a outrage, but also there's this suggestion that because a large part of the violence is also seen and especially against particular groups is also seen and um, sort of supported by um, you know social violence right uh, so a lot of the caste related violence or um, you know lynchings right or, um, of Muslims and uh, creation of terror uh, of various kinds has also meant that the outrage you know, um, is sort of mediated by all these, right, different sites of violence. Um, so that it is not just that you're looking at police violence, you're also looking at images and videos of social violence. And so I do think that there's that particularity, uh, which um, sort of becomes a really important thing. I would also say that, you know, uh, Bollywood has typically normalized police violence. Right, and torture. Um, and while now there are um, a few films like the one that I just mentioned, you know, Jai Bhim, um, you know, it, it has created a kind of a focus on custodial violence, um, but, uh, but those are rare um, and uh, basically, um, you know, um, haven't yet, right, become such a uh, point of conversation uh, in terms of creating the same outrage. Thank you for your question. All right, uh, we still have time for some more questions. If there's anyone who has anything, I, I don't see anything in the chat. Oh, Will has his hand up. Uh, go ahead, Will. I think you're still muted. Oh. You're muted. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> Sorry about that. I guess that's the norm. Um, thank you. I was saying thank you, David, for calling on me. And thank you, Ginny, for a very thoughtful talk, which I've been pondering. And um, I mean, in regard to Celia's question, I also think that I can remember being, I mean, of a certain age, and I can remember um, this film when I was a kid. Hmm. What was it called? Uh, but it was about drug, you know, people who had carried drugs to Turkey and they were tortured, you know, they were thrown into prison and it was a sort of, I don't know, it was called the Marrakesh Express or something, I can't remember. Yeah. But um, it was kind of a famous film some years ago. And what was um, distinctive about it was that, you know, there's, kids having fun who got arrested. And it was about the excessive violence of the Turkish state. Mm -hmm. And I felt like because of the media and medium in which it came out, which was a popular film, there was a sort of public normative correctional 
you know, um, it was both doing geopolitical work, but also it was a, you know, part of the war against drugs. And so at any rate, that <laughs> the last interchange um, made me think of that. And what I was thinking about though, uh, as, as my question would be, some of this, um, you know, you look at films like 24 or television mm -hmm. serials like 24, which you referenced in your work, there's this kind of um, complicity of the public, at least in the US, with torture in some circumstances. Right. Like in some circumstances it's justified, right? Particularly when there's an urgency to get information out of a suspect. Mm -hmm. And um, there are tons of uh, practices, policing practices, which I would uh, very easily accept into a broad category of torture that happened that don't ever get talked about, right? Starting from, you know, bringing people out into an arrestable milieu and then everything that happens after they've been um, captured and so forth and so on. I'm just, I'm wondering, you know, there's a, there's a, a sort of everyday slapping, you know, poking kind of um, thing that, that uh, is more or less considered normative in, in some circles. And then there's torture, which is something very different, which is being carved out as a object of discourse. There's also a sclerotic judicial system, right, in India where cases can languish for months and years and so forth and so on. So I'm, I guess I'm asking a question about temporality, about the pace of, the pace in which there's an expectation of um, justice being done. There's the, you know, the question of terrorism versus somebody has committed a theft and might be also subject to torture in the latter case. I guess I, I don't have a clear question, but is there a, you know, what is the, what sense do you have about um, when is torture okay in India? I mean, I know for you, it's not okay. <laughs> but when, when, can it, when can the public accept it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, so that's a great question. I will also say that, you know, uh, what you said about the Turkish film made me also remember uh, something that I wanted to mention earlier, which is that, you know, Midnight when... Express. It was Midnight Express. Okay, Midnight Express. Yes, yes. Okay. So, um, so um, you know, when Slumdog Millionaire came out, right? So, um, you know, again, Oscar and, you know, everything else, like the first scene uh, of Slumdog Millionaire is that of uh, the, you know, um, torture, right? Torture of um, um, the, uh, the boy, right? And basically, um, the senior officer looks away while the, you know, the junior person tortures, right? And there was this very interesting uh, story of how uh, apparently, initially, they showed that the senior officer was torturing. And um, when um, that scene was seen, uh, was actually, um, you know, I think there was a preview or something that the government basically said that don't show the senior officer torturing, right? You have the junior person see and the senior person looks away. And for me, you know, it's a very good um, sort of um, reflection of how there is both an acceptance of torture, right, uh, for very ordinary things. Um, and yet, right, because this was what? This was a game show, right? That was the context in which this was going on. But it becomes sort of representative of the mode, but it's something that the state has to always hide or distance itself from. And the way it does that is by claiming that it's, the, it's not the higher police who have any role to play in this, 
right? That's something that is coming from the kind of constraints that you are talking about, right? So basically, this idea that the Indian criminal justice system has, you know, all, all these cases languishing, nobody knows when a case will actually get to court or what is going to happen. So there are always these, um, you know, shortcuts, right? Um, to basically trying to get to justice. And that would mean that it could be just that some recovery of, you know, something happens to um, basically um, say that we've solved something, right? Um, or it can also be that you will encounter or kill the person uh, just to show that you are you're doing some justice in other contexts. So for me, wh what is um, what has been really important is to actually um, think about these sites in relation to each other, rather than um, you know sort of um, think about. I mean, I I look at the distinctions, the specificity of what happens in a terrorism related case versus a theft related case is important. Um, and there are different structures uh, that may uh, enable and who gets targeted will vary. But at the same time, what is very interesting for me is the, the actually both the temporality, but also the, uh, the, the role that questioning plays, right? So even when, you know, um, the, for instance, when I gave the example of Jai Bheem, right, you basically have a, um, a tribal person who's been picked up. It's in the name of theft. And there's this pressure that the, you know, the village um, head person is putting on the police to basically solve the case, right? And so in that moment, the question becomes the motive, even if it may or may not result into anything. So I actually do think that, you know, this what in the context of 24 is the ticking time bomb scenario has, there's a version of that that plays itself out as at least a um, sort of um, mo motivation presented for the police in all these different contexts, even if it can be about control, discipline, you know, reinforcing social hierarchies. But I do think that that plays a role. So that's how I sort of uh, think about it. I don't know whether that answers your question. Yeah, and so would yeah. you would you would you say also, which maybe you already have said, that 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 sense of ur you know whatever we translate yeah. from the 24 model of yeah. urgency um is much more easily applied to you know dalits muslims exactly you know. right absolutely right so because there it's not even like you don't have to think twice right because you know if if they are not protesting or they're not in a you know um sort of in a context where they're able to intervene then you just see that it will be the most marginalized who will get picked up, right? Or if there's a terrorism context, then, you know, in a locality, police will just go and pick up hundreds of uh, Muslim youth in the two cases that I talked about, um, you know, talk about in the book, I uh, basically look at Hyderabad and uh, Mumbai related uh, ter terror cases. And in both these, just, you know, Muslim uh, men were just randomly picked up, right? So, so absolutely that, um, you know, um, the urgency of whether it's about solving a case, right, or about, you know, immediately showing success or performing um, some kind of success does play a major role. And to that extent, I do think that, you know, um, the, the state wanting to, right, perform sort of some something which is a facade of a functional system or finding ways around a dysfunctional system becomes, and that's why you have encounter cops and others being promoted or, you know, uh, basically they are always recognized. Um, one of the things that one of the police officers had told me, which doesn't get talked about as much, is that uh, because they cannot show success in terms of convictions, right? 
basically they show success by state uh, through recovery of stolen goods or you know and it was remarkable and then i went and actually looked at the ncrb national crimes research bureau and that's true basically so you know there's a competition among the states about who can actually show that right so that becomes and that recovery then is something that you know is a big big incentive for the police to um you know use ways of torture right um and so uh, so i do think that uh, the framing become this framing becomes extremely important of urgency yeah and i i wonder whether like to demonstrate competence on behalf of the state as you just explained to us is to demonstrate your ability to quickly you know um apprehend the criminality of the marginal right yeah yeah because to, to go after an elite is to complicate things in a way right yeah i mean it could get into so i do feel that occasionally you know if you're a human rights activist right then maybe you know i mean you you do see at this particular moment where somebody you know in another context may be seen as elite but gets picked up just because they they were seen as supporting those who are marginalized right um so so i think it has the potential of getting extended uh, but in some other instances um but mostly right uh, it does uh, sort of echo um, or mirror the social hierarchies yes There's a question in the chat. I don't know if this is this a good time to. Oh, I don't know if I actually pushed off. Okay, so <laughs> the question in the chat uh, from uh, Shai Matani uh, Can you speak to the representation of state violence in so shows such as Crime Patrol, ESP? I don't know. Uh, along lines of caste and class, and the role of this, representa this representation plays or does not play in normalizing torture. How did Slumdog Millionaire disrupt or not disrupt these paradigms of inequality, reinforced or disrupted, would you say? Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I don't think I know all the uh, shows mentioned, so, uh, but I will say, I'll yeah. say two things. Um, you know, I think I follow the Bollywood uh, films much more, so let me just, you know, say that a little bit. I mean, I, I think um, it's both about, um, Sort of normalizing torture right i mean and showing the hero right so 24 was also about also creation of jack bauer as a hero mm -hmm. right and and you know i mean some of the stuff that i um, when i was writing about 24 i realized was that how often it came up in sort of political and legal discourses too. So for instance, you know, um, you would have, uh, I think famously, I think uh, Justice Scalia had once said, you know, uh, oh, but Jack Bauer is a hero, right? In some uh, context and, um, you know, would you punish him, you know, if he is trying to save the world? And the reason I mentioned that is um, because I think there's a circulation that happens across um, you know, legal, political, and the popular, right? So, um, and what is interesting is that because torture was defined in a very, very uh, narrow way in the US context, right? If you remember the Bybee memo sort of basically said it had to lead to organ failure and death, that meant that in a lot of different contexts, you also had um, sort of official reports making the same argument, right? In the Indian context, I think um, there, I mean, so I'm right now looking at um, uh, this um, show called Delhi, um, what is it called? Delhi Crime, no, um, the one in which uh, basically it's on the uh, rape case, right? So the investigation into the, um, um, the gang rape, um, and basically, we have different kinds of models, I think, now emerging, right? So uh, Delhi crime is all about how the police is super efficient. And what if they just, you know, uh, um, focus all their energies with a, a woman cop who has all the resources and has the right um, investigative uh, processes, right, then can actually get to the truth. 
right? And yet, on the other hand, so you will see that, you know, um, they, they follow all the norms, the, all the procedures. And it's an interesting uh, show to sort of counter uh, the other kinds of uh, normalization that you see in other uh, films where basically, um, you know, um, for instance, there's particularly, I think Tamil films have sort of uh, come up with ways of um, challenging the Bollywood um, normalizing, right? By pointing to how caste, class, gender is actually very central to um, who gets targeted in these, um, in many of these cases. So both the films, uh, Visanarai and Jai Bhim, actually show how uh, laborers and uh, in this case, um, um, uh, tribals uh, get targeted and how the system sort of makes it impossible um, to, uh, for them to actually uh, prove their innocence. Um, so I think you, you, when, when I started seeing some of these, um, you know, conversations around um, questioning um, the use of custodial violence or normalizing that had previously taken place in Bollywood films, but I still think that for the most part, it is the, you know, superhero cop uh, who, um, you know, can use all uh, the methods um, to solve cases. I will look up the other shows that were brought up. <laughs> Sorry. Will, it looks like you had your hand up. I know, it's just very unfair to ask more than one question. I don't think anyone else has a hand up, so it's definitely no, I'll, your, I'll your floor. <laughs> Time passed. Um, this is a broader question, Ginny. I, I'm wondering, like, do you have, um, what are your normative goals for your scholarship? In other words, do you hope that the work that you're doing will inform judicial process? Um, is this work that's connected to particular Political movement, you know. I'm, I'm you know, I, I think it's sometimes it's I mean, your work obviously has a lot of value, and for a, a range of actors and in, in the contemporary judicial landscape. I'm just I'm wondering what your intentionality is and your own um, hopes, you know, for your work and so forth. As some of us are scholars here, some of us may not be, but you know, we often wonder whether our work is of any value. I just like to hear you reflect on that. Yeah, I mean, um, the hope is the hope is that you know uh, it speaks to different kinds of um, um, conversations, right? So, so one of the things that uh, has been actually pretty remarkable is um, sort of, um, I mean, I think there was a huge absence of critical work. Uh, particularly academic work on this subject, right, of policing, on torture, particularly in the uh, Indian context, a lot more on actually colonial than uh, sort of post-colonial. And so, so but uh, that has, you know, really, really shifted. Um, so um, in, in such a way that there's resonances um, with broader conversations. And so I, I don't actually know some, I mean, um, it's hard to um, sort of have a, you know, unidirectional intentionality, right? So basically, um, you know, a lot of what I do is um, sort of inspired by the kind of work that civil liberty and democratic rights uh, scholars have done, uh, activists and um, writers have done. Um, but I also am very interested in um, thinking about what, how to make this a point of conversation within also academic, disciplinary, and intellectual circles. Because you know, one of the things that we see in the Black Lives Matter uh, context is sort of this thing that Michelle um, Alexander actually last year uh, wrote that you know, at least that's that was her sense that the reason why a lot more people were talking about prison abolition was because there was a very close relationship um, and a lot of work done by both grassroots circles and academic circles 
right? So that, you know, syllabi proliferated, there are courses and so on and so forth. So in some ways, you know, I hope some of the work that one is doing sort of uh, is able to, um, you know, contribute in a small way to sort of build that kind of, a, a, you know, a connection or intersection between different worlds, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you uh, for uh, the wonderful paper and, and for uh, the stimulating uh, conversation to all the questioners and, and your great answers. Uh, so please, everyone, we're at, at, uh, out of time right now. So if you'd welcome me or join me in I wish you uh, giving a big round of applause to uh, Professor Lokanita. I thank her for her presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much for these wonderful uh, questions. Uh, that was amazing. <laughs>